Hello, everyone. I know I'm a few weeks late uh, on the story, but uh, Legal Eagle just covered it last week. So I figure I'm still in good company to do a video now. It is a story you cannot make up. The New York Times is reporting that independent presidential candidate RFK Jr. said in a deposition in 2012 that a doctor told him a worm got into his brain, ate a portion of it, and then died. That's right. RFK Jr., environmental lawyer, anti-vax crusader, peddler of pseudoscience, and independent candidate for the president of the United States, claimed that he had a worm eat part of his brain. But the thing is, RFK Jr.'s story, at least his recollection of it, has a number of details that are either embellished, misremembered, or are just factually wrong. In short, it's not just his brain that may be full of holes. Some news outlets have picked up on a few of these inconsistencies, but I haven't seen all of them discussed, and I think they're important. While RFK Jr. is currently just a private citizen, and private citizens usually require, like, usually deserve a lot of privacy, um, he does want to be the next American president, arguably the most powerful person in the world, at arguably the most dangerous time for the world in the last 50 years. So whether he has a pars uh, brain damage from a parasitic worm is, in fact, all of our business. So what exactly did the New York Times report? On uh, May 8th, the Times reported that in 2012, during the divorce proceedings with his second wife, he argued that his earning power had been diminished by cognitive struggles, including brain fog and short and long-term memory, dating back to 2010. Because of, of those symptoms in 2010, he had consulted with several of the country's top neurologists and had a head CT that revealed a, quote, dark spot, initially attributed to cancer. But as he was preparing to travel to Duke to have the suspected tumor removed, he received a phone call from a doctor at New York Presbyterian who thought the spot was a, quote, worm that got into my brain and ate a portion of it and then died. Instead of surgery, he had multiple follow-up scans showing no change in the appearance of the spot, providing evidence for the dead brain worm hypothesis. So what is going on with this brain worm claim? First, is it possible for a worm even to get into your brain in the first place? The short answer is yes. This is a very well-described phenomenon, and although he reportedly could not remember the type of worm for the deposition, he has since confirmed that it was Tinea solium, uh, commonly known as the pork tapeworm. The life cycle of the pork tapeworm is interesting, and I, I think it bears spending a minute describing it. You start with tapeworm eggs in the environment, which are ingested by foraging pigs. Inside the pigs, the eggs hatch, and the larvae migrate within the pig to muscle tissue where they transform into a relatively dormant form called sister cerci, or uh, sister circus in the singular. Uh, sister cerci consists of fluid-filled sacs which are attached to a neck-like structure called a scolex that has these hooks and suckers to eventually grab onto the inside of someone's intestines. Humans then get infected by consuming undercooked pork that has the sister cerci in the meat that survived the cooking process. Once inside the human's intestines, the tapeworm then fully matures and can hang out there for years, growing longer and longer, while it releases more eggs into the person's stool, which then contaminates the environment where pigs can unknowingly eat them while foraging, and so on and so forth, which is just lovely. But neither in the sister cerci form that's in pork meat, nor in the mature form in the human gut, can tinea solium migrate on its own through the body. So how does this organism get into the human brain? For that, the person needs to consume the tapeworm eggs directly from an environmental source rather than from eating pork, because then the eggs hatch inside the human, allowing the new mobile larvae to migrate up here. Once the larvae reach the brain and form sister cerci there, the patient is said to have a disease called neurosister cercosis. Despite infection seeming to require multiple lapses in basic sanitation, such as both free-roaming pigs and the contamination of food by human feces, the pork tapeworm is surprisingly common in many parts of the world, including places where RFK Jr. is known to have extensively traveled. Cross-sectional studies of rural, vil uh, rural villages in endemic areas have found as many as one in five people have evidence of neurosister sarcosis on imaging, the overwhelming majority of whom are asymptomatic. And when the disease does become symptomatic, 
It's believed to happen years after the initial infection occurred. So in short, RFK Jr.'s claim that he had, and in fact, still has a dead worm in his brain, is absolutely possible, and it's not a stretch at all. But this does bring us to the first misconception he seems to have. Tinea solium doesn't literally eat brain tissue. After a larva migrates to the brain and transforms into the relatively dormant cystocerci uh, form, the immune system walls it off within a cyst-like structure where over months to years it becomes non-viable, meaning it is very slowly killed by the immune system. It's the dead cyst that is seen on brain scans as a whole, rather than a vacuum that's been carved out by the worm munching it through neurons. And that brings us to another potential misconception. Neurosister sarcosis does not usually cause memory loss and brain fog as initial symptoms. Instead, it usually presents with headache and or seizures. Cognitive problems are usually seen only when there is a multitude of cysts, whereas RFK Jr. has said he has had just one. For example, here's an MRI scan of a patient with severe neurosister sarcosis. Now, we don't have a copy of any of RFK Jr. scans, but they may have showed something similar to just one of these spots. The most probable explanation here regarding his symptoms is that RFK Jr.'s apparent neurosister sarcosis had nothing to do with his cognitive symptoms. It was an incidental finding that probably did not cause him any problems in the past, nor at this point will likely cause any problems in the future. He's just going to have this dead worm sitting there for the rest of his life. As to what was causing his cognitive problems, we'll get to that in a few minutes. Before that, though, here's a recent clip from an interview RFK Jr. gave to a talk radio program called Pushing the Limits, where he describes in more detail how his diagnosis was made. And this version of the story is quite different. Yeah, in 2010, I was having brain fog and I was having trouble with word retrieval and uh, short-term memory. And a friend of mine, I was, I was trying to figure out what it was. A friend of mine uh, told me I should get a brain scan and he arranged for me to do it. And I went and got, when I got a CAT scan, they found a black spot in my brain. And the doctors immediately said, that's a tumor. Very briefly, RFK Jr. said that after a single CT scan, the doctors immediately said, that's a tumor. Obviously, I was not in the room and we have no idea who these doctors were. But the doctors I work with would never speak that definitively about a diagnosis based on one piece of data. So I, I think he's embellishing here. My uncle, Ted Kennedy, had just died of a glioblastoma. Oh, and he had been the chair, Brian, of the, of the Health Committee for 50 years in the United States Senate. So we had access to these incredible battery of really great doctors. And... Um, and they, they were all on speed dial, all the best cancer doctors, brain tumor doctors in the world. So we sent my films out to all of them. And they all said, yeah, it's a tumor and you got to have it removed. So I was uh, scheduled to go down, I think it was on a Tuesday, to get my brain cut open and this tumor removed. Wow. Um, in, in, at Duke in North Carolina. And uh, by the same doctor who had done my uncle. And I went to pick up on the Monday, I went to pick up my films, the x-rays, the CAT scans at Columbia Presbyterian in New York. And it, there happened to be this young Irish doctor who was a neurosurgeon who was sitting in the room. And he and I started talking with each other about a variety of things. And he asked what I was doing. And I said, I got this tumor in my brain. And he said, can I look at your films? And they put them up on the light board. Mm -hmm. And he looked at it for a long, long time. And then he said, I don't think you've earned a, a surgery. And he said, I don't think this is a tumor. And he said, what you need to do is come back in a couple of weeks. And we need to measure it carefully now. Come back in a couple of weeks and see if it grows. And um, and so we did that and it didn't grow. And then we came back another six weeks and it didn't grow. And then they, in the end, they said that this is almost certainly a parasite um, that got into your brain 
they call it a neurocystic cirrhosis, cirrhosis, I may have left out a, a syllable. And that it's a parasite that's very common in India where I had done a lot of environmental work. From my perspective as a physician, this version of how he got his diagnosis is not believable. First, why is he picking up physical copies of brain scans immediately before flying to another state for brain surgery the following day? Is he suggesting that a top academic neurosurgeon at Duke was willing to commit to a tumor resection on a patient without already having copies of the relevant scans? Because that doesn't happen. You know, maybe he was flying to Duke to meet with a surgeon for a consultation to discuss a potential resection, in which case it would be common to be asked to bring copies of his scans, though on a CD, you know, not physical prints. Next, where exactly is he in the hospital where a neurosurgeon is just sitting there in the room with him? Neither the film library nor the medical records office where a patient would pick up copies of their own films or scans um, are places where surgeons just hang out. You know, I can't testify as to the physical layout of New York Presbyterian in 2010, but in every hospital where I've worked, the film library where patients pick up copies of their own studies is not the same place where doctors physically sit to look at those studies. For example, at my current hospital, those two locations are literally in different buildings. But, you know, whatever. Even if we give RFK Jr. the benefit of the doubt here, what surgeon is going to look at a person's brain scan, a person who they just met and who is not their patient, and not only offer an off-the-cuff, face-to-face medical opinion on it, but also start giving medical advice and arranging follow-up scans? Doctors at a hospital like New York Presbyterian, they're not going to do that. There would be huge medical legal liability with that kind of thing. And RFK Jr., as per his own assertion, had already had consulted with some of the nation's best neurosurgeons about his scans. Remember, they were on speed dial. Yet, nevertheless, he's going to take the word of some uh, random doc he just meets in some hospital waiting room over all those other like world experts. That doesn't, that doesn't pass the sniff test either. But for me, here's the kicker as to why I don't believe this version of RFK Jr.'s story. Major academic centers were no longer using physical films and light boxes in 2010. Despite what you may see on TV and in the movies, radiology studies have been digital for a long time. I last saw a light box used in a hospital when I was a med student in 2002, coincidentally at NYU, which is a peer institution to New York Presbyterian that's, that's literally down the street. And even if RFK Jr. was given physical hard copies of his brain scan, and the radiology department still had obsolete light boxes that hadn't yet been removed, the image size and resolution on a printed brain CT or MRI would be too poor for a neurosurgeon to make an assertion like that regarding a finding that would have necessarily been small. You know, these, these cysts from uh, neurocystic sarcosis, they're not big. So, in short, this story of RFK Jr.'s um, about a chance meeting with an Irish neurosurgeon in the film library of New York Presbyterian being the sole step that prevented an unnecessary brain surgery. I don't buy it at all. If only one of these problems with this story were present, then okay, maybe it was just a one-off unusual circumstance. But for all these unusual circumstances to line up and be present at the same time, nah, I just, I just, in the interview just feels like over the top embellishment to make an engaging story and not remotely the truth. So, why should we care about this? Well, if RFK Jr. was happy remaining a celebrity pseudoscientific conspiracy theorist, we wouldn't care. When I meet a random person at social events and they share some obviously BS medical story with me as if it were true, you know, like whatever. It's, it's just a story at a party. It doesn't bother me. But when RFK Jr., you know, he wants to be the next U.S. president, while there is a certain degree of embellishment in storytelling, which is excusable and in some contexts, perhaps even desirable, this is not an example of that. This is not your coworker giving a funny made up story about how their dog got, uh, got their name or how they met their spouse. This is a presidential candidate who appears to be bullshitting details of their neurologic health. That is not okay. And there's, there's more in the interview to talk about. 
And Mr. Kennedy, you suffered from, is this true? You suffered from back then, this was over 10 years ago, memory loss and mental fog. Have you made a full recovery? Yeah, what happened is at the same time, I was having my mercury tested. I, I was getting all kinds of tests and my mercury test came back sky high. So 10 times what you know the EPA levels were for, for blood mercury, I think it was. But they were very, very, they were over 10 times what, what anybody considered safe. Right. And I had that, that chelated out and all of that brain fog went away. So you've made a full recovery. Is that fair to say? Yeah. Regarding normal versus safe versus toxic blood mercury levels, there is a surprising lack of consensus about it. You might imagine that the CDC or someone has determined that such and such is the value of mercury above which people can get neurologic symptoms of toxicity. And everyone agrees on that threshold. But in reality, there is no well-defined, universally agreed upon value for this. Uh, the science is, is murky. So when, when RFK Jr. states that his levels were 10 times what the EPA deemed was safe, I'm not sure he knows what he's talking about. He might be trying to say that his blood mercury was 10 times what's normal based on the murky data about normality. And that's perfectly plausible. I mean, the EPA does publish values uh, about normal mercury levels, but the threshold of what's normal is not the same as the threshold of what's safe or the threshold of when symptoms might start to occur. Uh, as to how he could have developed mercury toxicity in the first place, RFK Jr. has attributed that to his love of eating fish, uh, tuna in particular. That seems surprising. You have to remember, this man um, this man has been crusading against vaccines for many years, including promoting demonstrably false claims about mercury in vaccines. So how does an intelligent person who extols healthy living and eating in many other venues and many other parts of his life, and who has delusional fears about mercury, become an extreme outlier with mercury toxicity in his own body through ignoring very common and well-known advice about limiting the consumption of certain types of seafood. Now, is it possible that he loved tuna so much that it overwhelmed his belief in how dangerous it was? Yeah, sure, people would certainly do that with all kinds of things, from alcohol to ice cream. But to get as mercury toxic as he's claiming to have been, you need to eat a lot of tuna, like a fat, like an incredible amount of tuna. There's also the question as to whether chronic mercury toxicity would even cause the memory problems and brain fog that RFK Jr. described. On one hand, yes, it can do this, but on the other, they are not really the most commonly cited manifestations of the neurotoxicity of chronic organic mercury to um, of chronic organic mercury poisoning that would be caused by the exception, uh, excessive consumption of mercury-laden seafood. Now, there are different forms of mercury. Not all mercury toxicity is the same. Um, and the symptoms of toxicity depends on which form of mercury has been ingested. Mercury in seafood is in the form of methylmercury, which is also ironically called organic mercury. Now, we actually know precisely the symptoms caused by chronic methylmercury poisoning due to a progressive neurodegenerative disease called Minamata disease. This was observed in Japan in the 1950s and 60s when cumulatively, thousands of locals became ill after consuming seafood poisoned by industrial waste that was being re released into the Minamata Bay. And there was a second large cluster of thousands of cases in Minam of Minamata disease that occurred in Iraq in the 1970s from methylmercury-containing fungicide that was used to treat grain seeds, which in retrospect seems like an obviously terrible idea. In both cases, Symptoms in these clusters were very similar. Uh, it caused paresthesias and numbness, classically of the hands, feet, lips, and tongue, ataxia or difficulty with coordination, including speech, and visual disturbances, such as concentric constriction of the visual fields. The reason for this specific combination is not well understood, but it was a consistent observation in multiple different locations over many, many different years. Now, no, not every patient needs to follow the textbook description of disease. Memory loss and brain fog, they're not, they're not described in the primary medical literature as common manifestations from methylmercury poisoning, with two notable exceptions. One is if the exposure happened while the, the patient was, was a fetus in utero, those patients can have long-term cognitive problems starting from you know childhood. 
And the second is that methylmercury ingestion has been proposed as a risk factor for the development of Alzheimer's disease. But neither of these are relevant to RFK Jr. RFK Jr. also claims that chelation therapy removed the mercury from, uh, from his body and cured his cognitive problems, while in fact, chelation therapy has not been established to be effective in treating any neurologic symptoms from chronic mercury toxicity. Taking all this into account, I suppose it's possible that the mercury-averse RFK Jr. ate enough tuna in 2010 to experience mercury toxicity. And for someone with confirmed methylmercury toxicity, it's possible that could cause brain fog and memory problems, even in the absence of more commonly reported symptoms of ataxia and paresthesia. And for someone with cognitive symptoms from mercury, it's plausible that those problems could get better to some extent with chelation therapy. But I think considering everything altogether, this is unlikely. Similar to the Irish neurosurgeon hanging out in the film library story, when the situation as re described requires not just one unlikely event, but several independent unlikely events lining up together, it becomes that much harder to believe the whole picture. Instead, I think the more likely scenario is that his mercury tests were not nearly as abnormal as he implied, and his symptoms got better on their own because whatever his actual diagnosis was just resolved on its own. As no doubt someone will point out in the comments, I don't have any access to RFK Jr.'s medical records, so I don't have any idea what was going on with him in 2010 that wasn't revealed either by the New York Times story or which he didn't reveal by himself in the talk radio interview. But in general, temporary and self-resolving problems with cognitive function are really common, and they can be related to an infection, electrolyte dis uh, derangements, the side effect of a medication he was taking at the time, an interaction between, between food and a medication he was taking at the time that made the medication more toxic than normal, uh, transient thyroid dysfunction, substance abuse, mental illness, or even just psychosocial stressors. Just because he got chelation therapy and his symptoms improved does not at all mean that he had symptomatic methylmercury toxicity. I'm going to close by reiterating something that uh, I said in, um, and discussed a little bit at the beginning of the video. Talking and speculating about RFK Jr.'s medical history is both relevant and just because A, he wants to become the most powerful person in the world, and B, we are talking specifically about his cognitive abilities and brain health here. In summary, his public explanation of this issue is unconvincing. That does not necessarily mean he's lying, nor does it necessarily mean that he has ongoing memory problems. But it does kind of suggest he has one of these. And I don't think it really matters to us which one it is. Either one, it's concerning to observe this about a presidential candidate. Anyway, I'll return to a more conventional medical education topic with the next video. Uh, but, you know, do let me know in the comments what you think about me tackling the neurologic health of, let's say, another U.S. president, a presidential candidate uh, in another video sometime later, later this summer.